Take your Bible, turn to the book of Genesis chapter 2, if you would. Genesis chapter 2. Appreciate um, you coming out to be with us on the Lord's Day. Those of you with us here, those of you watching online, we appreciate it. And um, appreciate the prayers uh, for Sweetie Pie and the cards. I've got several cards on my desk I'm going to take home for her, let her read them and lift her up. And uh, we do certainly, certainly appreciate that. Genesis chapter 2. Do you believe the Bible? Say amen. Amen. Because God's going to introduce here uh, in Genesis chapter 2. He's going to introduce commandments. He's going to introduce the law. And he's not just giving this earth and all that pertains to it to Adam to do whatever he wants to, however he wants to do it, whenever he wants to do it, and so on. He's going to give him a guideline. At first, and we'll see this as we get into it, he's going to give him one law, one rule. Just one, just one. And say, don't, whatever you do, don't do this. You have everything else you can do, but whatever you do, don't do this, and we'll get to that shortly. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth uh, and the heavens and every plant of the field before it was in the earth and the every herb of the field before it grew for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was not a man to till the ground but there went up a midst a mist from the earth and watered the whole earth or the whole face of the ground. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. And of course, we talked about last Sunday night about how your cat is not waiting for you in heaven. Uh, your dog, your puppy dog that died is not going to be waiting for you, wagging his tail for you to enter the pearly gates. Those things are not going to happen. That makes some people angry. It makes them upset when I say that. But I do not believe that salvation is given to creatures other than the creature of man. The one to whom God breathed his, his breath into man, giving mankind the living soul that man has. That's what sets man apart from all of the other creation is that he has been giving a, a living soul. I, I watched the other day um, a video documentary of them discovering some new species that was a predecessor of man, in other words, a species that came before mankind. And when I looked at it, Ron, I I just kind of I, you know, scratched my head, and I looked at that, and they had a, a most of a skull, and I went, it looks like a monkey. It looks like a gorilla. Why is it that because they dug this up and they, they say that it's a hundred million years ago or a million years ago or whatever, that this is an ancestor of humans, why would they say that when all it does, it looks like a gorilla or an ape or a monkey of some kind? I don't understand where they get that from? I don't understand how they can take a tooth, build a whole skeleton around it, and out of that whole skeleton, build a whole lifestyle around this particular predecessor of man, but there's no evidence of that. I just don't understand that. What I understand is, I didn't come from monkeys. 
I didn't come from gorillas. I didn't come. A guy, a guy asked the right question. If we came from monkeys, how come there are still monkeys? I don't get that. Did they all revolt? And said, we're not standing upright. There's no way in the world. We're not doing that. I, I don't get that. But it just, it doesn't make sense to me. God created man in his image and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And by the way, at this point, there is only one man on the face of the entire earth. No other man exists. In monkey form, or near monkey form, or near human form, no other man exists anywhere in the planet. So I spent a little time explaining sort of the water canopy that was above the earth, how that when God finally decided to flood the earth, he just ripped open that canopy and all that water that was being held up there just came crushing down. Uh, upon the earth. And so now Genesis chapter 2, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living soul. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing and leadership tonight. Father, we come before you tonight. We do thank you, Lord, for a day that you've given us, a beautiful day, uh, Lord, that you've brought to bear. You've given us probably just enough rain uh, for harvest time. Father, we pray for a good harvest for all of our farmers who are depending on that harvest for their livelihood. We pray, dear God, that you would bless them and give them just the right amount of rain at the exact amount of time, Lord, that they need in order for them to bring in the sheaves that uh, you've called them to do. And Father, we ask, dear God, that likewise we would see that the field is this world and that the workers are not ready. So, Father, I pray, dear God, that you would train us as workers, train us to work in your field, to reach out to people, to be willing to sacrifice reputation, to be willing, dear God, to give out what this church produces, what it does. Pray that you bless those, Lord, who were part of yesterday. And Father, they may not have understood exactly what they were doing. But Father, they were promoting your kingdom and your name and your honor. And everything that you've done through me You've done for me. And I thank you, dear God, for doing those things. Father, we just ask God that you bless and open up our eyes tonight on the study of your word. Father, we just pray, God, that you would give us light and understanding of why you made us the way you made us, Father. And what it means for our lives and the lives of the people around us. Father, give us quick understanding, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Now, the last verse, Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God caused, or the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living soul. By the way, I, I'm, I'm doing some study right now on some her heresy literature. Um, in 1945, a farmer found a collection of books, which was unusual at the time, because if you know about how they used to write things out, they used to write them on long lengths of scrolls. They would roll those scrolls up real tight, put them in, in clay jars and put the lid on it, hide them in a cave somewhere, whatever. But this is one of the earliest known book forms that uh, has ever been found. And whoever wrote out 
what's in these books, actually folded them and bound them together into books like your Bible is a book now instead of a scroll where you have to roll it all out to find Isaiah, you can just turn the page. Well, this was one of the first times this had ever been discovered. It's called the Nag Hammadi text. And it's full of heresy. And I won't get into all the heresies that are there, but one of the heresies is that the Creator really isn't the Father of the universe. The Creator, the one who made man, is a woman by the name of Sophia. Now, anybody want to take a wild guess as to what her name is in the Bible? What's just a, just a few to just Oh, let's see here. John, I'm not, I'm not, you don't count. Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So they said, the Nag Hammadi texts say that it was Sophia that created these inferior humans. And, uh, and put them in there, made them out of clay, made them out of dirt, made them inferior and made them to be slaves and all this kind of garbage and on and on and on and on. But that's a lie. They just didn't like what God said. Now, I'll throw in a little extra. If you remember from Sunday school this morning, I was showing you all these Greek texts that the Bibles come from the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. Those two Greek manuscripts were heavily influenced by the Gnostics who wrote the Nag Hammadi text. They did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh. So every chance they had to take that out of the text of the New Testament, they did it. And they did it quite well. And there's been some, there's websites where they'll measure out what the King James says about Jesus' divinity versus what the New Bible say about Jesus' divinity. And they say they come up lacking. And I'll give you an example. Um, what, is, what is it? Second Timothy 3.16, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. And the NIV says, he appeared in a body, but not God manifest in the flesh. That's been altered, that's been changed, not just translated differently, it's in the Greek that way. They rewrote the Greek text to make it say just that he appeared in a body, but not that God was manifest in the flesh. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw, that was a free sermon you get from me. I'm not charging you a dime for this, I promise you. All right. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 gives us a good, um, a good rundown of what all of this means. Adam became a living soul. But there's one greater than Adam here. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. And so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And that's what you find. Into his, breath, uh, in his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. So that's what you find here. The first Adam, the first man Adam was made a living soul. But the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You know what a quickening, what does that phrase mean? A quickening spirit. What does that mean? That spirit has the ability to take something that's dead and bring it back to life again. That's what that spirit has. And what, what was one of the miracles that Jesus did? There was a widow whose son had died. What did Jesus do? Rose, he raised him from the dead. 
There was Lazarus who had been dead four days. Surely he stinketh. Don't roll that stone away, Jesus. Ro take ye away the stone. They rolled the stone away. Three words. Lazarus come forth. Three is the number for resurrection. Lazarus come forth. He that was dead came forth. So while the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made the guy who can make a living soul. Somebody say amen. That's the difference between the two Adams. How be it? Uh, verse 46. How be it that which that was not. How be it that was not first which is spiritual. But that which is natural. And afterward that which is spiritual. God showing you his process. You have to live the natural life first. Then your greater spiritual life. So reason 4,987 why Joel Osteen is a liar. When he says you can have your best life now. No, you can't. Not if you're really going to be saved. If you're really going to be saved. They're going to come at you like crazy. They're going to try to mess you up. They're going to try to torture you. They're going to try to torment you. I, uh, somebody called me and they're going through, somebody in this church, they're going through quite a bit of problems. And they said, I've got Catholic friends and I've got friends who go to all these other churches that I just don't like. I just don't trust them. They just don't seem right. They never seem to have the troubles in their life that I have. I said, think about that. The devil is giving them their best life. And it's a trap. As long as they keep getting their joys and their jollies or their pretensions from these religious experiences, they'll keep following them. Meanwhile, you, you're striving, you're having a hard time, you've got the devil fighting you every day, you don't know how long you're going to last. I'm telling you, that is the manifest sign that God loves you and he is on your side. And he is not, he is not going to ever let you go and let you fall. He's not going to do that. But that's what she told me. So, verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven as is the earthy such are they also that are earthy and as is the heavenly such are they also that are the heavenly now I don't know if I've ever told you this but I wanted to be an astronaut. Did you never know that, Mom? Well, you should have. I read books on astronauts from the school library. I got up and watched the first space shuttle, Columbia, lift off. First time I ever heard the word software because it had software shut down. First, they were going to try to send the rocket up and there was a software shut down. And I'm going, software, what is that? And I'm going, it must be the difference. It must be the opposite of hardware. And then I started putting it together. Software runs the hardware. But that's what it was. There was a software glitch and they couldn't. But anyway, I used to follow that. I watched... Um, who were the first two Columbia pilots? Uh, I 
Joe Engel, Dick Truly. Those are the those are the first four of them were Joe Engel, Dick Truly. Um, I can't remember them now, but I used to know these names. I used to know as much as a civilian could know about all of this stuff that goes on in space, and I loved it. One of these days, I'm going to get to go see it without a spaceship. I'm going to go see it all. Amen? So verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall be sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So if you're looking at the reason why in Genesis 2 that God put the story of Adam getting breath from God and becoming a living soul, the number two is the number for division. And it always shows the two events, the two major events. The two major events are the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. Two major events are the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Gentiles and the second outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the Jews. The... Um, the, your first birth, but then your second birth. And your second birth is better than your first birth. Amen. Okay. Um, the first heaven and earth passed away. Now the new heaven and the new earth, which is going to live and abide forever. So that's what that number two represents. It always shows this is how God works. This is how he does it. Does it good the first time, but he does it absolutely astounding the second time. And the second time is breathtaking. Or the opposite of that is we know that all of those who die lost, their body goes to the same ground and corrupts along with our bodies. However, there is a second resurrection. A resurrection, what we call the resurrection of the damned. And the resurrection of the damned is all of those who are doomed are going to be given a new body that will feel the torture given by the lake of fire, but without shutting itself down. I mean, that's what happened with Lisa the other night. She got up. She shouldn't have got up. She tried to get ice. She shouldn't have done that. But then all of a sudden, she almost passes out because... Uh, the, the amount of pain that she is in almost overwhelms her so much that she can't take it anymore. Your body has a sort of a shutdown system. It goes into shock, right? Well, this new body, God removes that. And people end up in the lowest hell, just like in the lowest part of a lake. The lowest part of a lake, the lower you go, what, what's the temperature of the water? The lower you go into a lake or an ocean. It's colder and colder and colder. We'll reverse that then. If this is a lake of fire, the lower you go down in there, hotter and hotter and hotter. And that second resurrected body, God has removed their ability to pass out. During this, they're going to have to endure the full force of God's wrath. I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want anything to do with it. 
Now back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Here's the tree of life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward. Genesis 2, verse 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now I want you to see this. God takes the tree of life and plants it right here. In the midst of the garden. God takes the tree of knowledge of good and evil and plants it right here in the midst of the garden. What he doesn't do with the tree of knowledge of good and evil is find the highest mountain peak, the, remote, the most remote area on the earth and hide it way over there so that Adam could not possibly in a lifetime have access to it. It's not what he does. You think about that. It's the nature of God. He puts both trees in the midst of the garden. And gives explicit instructions. By the way, this Nag Hammadi Gnostic text that I was telling you about a while ago, where it's Sophia that created man. Guess what? Guess what her instructions were concerning that tree? You shouldn't eat of it, neither are you allowed to touch it, lest you die. She added that. She made that part up. At no time did God ever tell Adam, Adam, I don't want you touching that tree. I don't want you walking around it. I don't want you to lean against it. Don't want you to sit under it. I don't want... God didn't tell him that. Adam, those fruits could have fallen. Adam could have raked them all up. Dumped them over into a compost pile or whatever. He could have done whatever he wanted. Just couldn't eat it. So he's got the two trees planted. Out of the ground made the Lord God grow to every tree that is pleasant in the sight, and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he puts them next to each other. And God tells Adam, choose. Because, uh, let me give you a couple verses about the tree of life. Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The Garden of Eden was a earthly model of the paradise of God. Adam was living literally in heaven on earth. Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, on the other side of the river, was there the tree of life. And I want you to notice this. The tree of life bare 12 manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their Foreheads. Now, what I believe is going to happen is, once God has made the new heaven and the new earth, 
and he's got the devil and all the wickedness cast in the lake of fire, and there's no chance that wickedness is ever going to come out again. And so God then now has the tree of life. And we find out that every month the tree of life is bearing a different kind of fruit, which is, which is kind of weird. But let's say during the month of April, it'll grow apricots. Okay. <laughs> I don't, that's, that's all I've got. That's all the joke. I'm trying to think of other months. Huh? Yeah, Mayberries in May. Huh? February berries in February. But every month it's bearing 12 manner of fruits and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. No death, no sickness, nothing. And it's like, you know, everything down here goes in cycles. A tree can only bring forth fruit one time a year and that's it. But God's going to lift that and this tree is going to bear fruit every single month for the healing of the nations. I love that. I love that. Uh, Revelation 22, 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the mouth of the throne of God and of the Lamb in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves were, of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There should be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Remember the two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they might have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through gates into the city. For without are, for what's the first one on the list? Dogs. So your puppy dog is not sitting at the gates of Pearl, wagging his tail, waiting for you to show up. I'm sorry, but that's just how it is. Dogs, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Politicians, newspaper journalists, um, editorialists, Hollywood actors, false teachers, false prophets, false preachers, they all fit into that category. They will not have access to the tree of life. So now, Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, there was a river that went out of Eden. I've got a theory about this. Let's see if I put it in here. No. The river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and, there, and became into how many heads? The four is the number for what? What's the number four tell you in this passage? What is it there for? Huh? Gospel. Jesus told the woman at the well that he had the water of life. What else? Spiritual world. The spiritual, the number four indicates something of the spiritual realm it's like we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places there's four things there we have the four kingdoms of the book of daniel and i think that fourth kingdom is a spiritual kingdom a kingdom literally of spirits devils gods things like that so i think this River Euphrates, which is the fourth river, has significance. Let's look at it. 
and a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, and there is gold. The gold of that land is good, and there is bdellium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gion. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. The name of the third river is Hittichel. That is it which goeth up toward the east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. Now there's something river about, there's something river about the river. Something interesting about the river Euphrates. Turn to Revelation chapter 9. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 9. The Bible says, verse 13, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from heaven, or I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before the throne of God, which is before God saying to the sixth angel which had the saying which had the trumpet loose the four angels which are bound in the great river what euphrates now here's what's interesting to me is that you have the naming of these four rivers once the flood occurs these rivers don't exist anymore it's changed the whole layout of the land the only river that, to our knowledge, that existed after the flood was the river Euphrates. And in the river Euphrates, you had four angels, the spiritual world, bound in the great river Euphrates. The four angels were loosed, which were prepared for, count it, an hour, a day, a month, and a year. It's four things. Uh, to slay the third part of men. The number of the army, uh, the horsemen were 200,000, thousand, and I heard the number of them. So it's just interesting to me that out of all the rivers that are mentioned here in Genesis chapter 2, apparently only the river Euphrates survived this. And since the river Euphrates says the fourth river is Euphrates. I have a theory. You want to know what the theory is? Who wants to know what the theory is? Some of you don't, so I'm not going to share it. All right. When Joshua had God's people taking them into the promised land, before they could go there, they had to stop a river from flowing so they could cross to get that, that boundary. That river was a boundary. The Mississippi River makes the boundary of the state of Missouri. The eastern boundary of the state of Missouri is the Mississippi River. Wherever the river flows, that's the boundary of the state. And it's been that way, it's been like that way all over the world. Battles throughout history were won or lost, depending sometimes on whether or not they could get across a certain river or the enemy could destroy the ability to get across a certain river. So anyway, <clears throat> I think Euphrates represents a river that separates not really us from heaven, but us 
from hell. In mythology, there is a story that says there is a river called the River Styx, S-T-Y-X. That's where the rock group Styx got their name from. That the river Styx separates our world from hell. And if you had a, someone who died who had to go to the underworld, the ferryman who took them across the river had to be paid. So that's why they would put coins in their eyes. They'd take the coins, pocket the coins, and thus convey the dead to the land of the dead. Now, that's just mythology, I understand that. But it just leads me to believe that God has sort of gone out of his way to describe these four rivers. The fourth one being Euphrates, and to my knowledge, the fourth one, Euphrates, is the only one that survived the flood of Noah. And God does have bound inside that ain't that river four evil angels that are prepared for four time prophecies and so on. So anyway, it's just something to think about. That between us and hell, there's a river. Between us and heaven, there is also a river. Which is what I think water baptism represents. Is that you have been passed from, you've gone through the river. And you're now to the other side. You have the resurrection of life. Okay? Just... You just write that down, say that I said it, and when we get to heaven, show it to me and say, oh, could you, you remember that? I'd go, yeah, I was so stupid then. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Do what? Which country... Had created that river? Oh, it's in Iraq. Right now it's in Iraq. Yeah. And actually, what, which is interesting to me, is that God actually gave the land between the river Nile, the river of Egypt, all the way to the land of Euphrates. And Israel has never possessed all of that land. Ever. Which tells me, God's going to give it to them. All of it. Between those two rivers. All right, now, to Genesis chapter 2. This, this is, now this is the message for tonight. This is what I wanted to get into. <clears throat> Genesis 2, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it up and to keep it. And then the Lord God commanded the man, saying, One day... The Holy Ghost said to me, Mike, count these words. Just like that. So I did. Of the tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. There are 39 words exactly in that phrase. And there are 39 books of the Old Testament. The law. Even theologians, theologians who have not counted these words, would not count these words, would suggest to you that this is really a prototype of the whole of the law of obedience. In other words, God has... How many sins are there in the world as of this point now? How many sins are there in this world, there can only be one. I mean, Adam and Eve are running around naked in public. That's a misdemeanor. 
could be a felony, depending on what they were doing. But that wasn't a crime. There was no law about anything except eating the fruit from that tree. And the words that God spoke in our King James Bible was 39 exactly. And there are 39 books in the law, the Old Testament. Now, I always like to, to share with people, that's a fact. If you want to go back and check me out on that and count those words, then you do it. And I promise you, because I've checked it dozens of times, there are exactly 39 words there. There's, that's a fact. What you do with that fact is your business. But I have seen so many word patterns like this in this one Bible. It just leads me to believe that this Bible and everything in it is right and it's in a perfect order. God doesn't make mistakes, does he? So it's the proto-law, it's the, like the Old Testament. In this, one, in this one commandment lies all of the Old Testament. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served with that were on their side uh, of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So what God was doing here was God was giving Adam choice. Those of you who think your dog is going to heaven, does your dog have a choice about, I don't know, when it wants to lick itself? Does your dog have a choice concerning that? Courtney, does your dog have a choice? Have you explained to your dog? Now, what's your dog's name? Huh? Joy. Joy, let me explain something to you. When you do that, it just kind of makes you look bad. The kids start asking. So can I ask you never to do that again? Joy goes, oh, sure, I understand. I, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, I... I promise you I will never do that again. Has that ever happened? And never will, will it? Why? She's a dog. Dogs don't get that choice. God's dogs cannot look at the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil and see any of them as being any different than any of the rest of the trees. They'll eat from whatever they want. Mark chapter 15, you can turn there. God put these two trees right in the midst of the garden. Mark chapter 15, verse 7, and there was one called Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude cried aloud, began to desire him to do as he had done, uh, ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, What will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. But the chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. So, I mean, the, the idea is, is that Paul, God, not Paul, Pontius Pilate is wanting to make some political points here. And he's going, I know this Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. So I'm going to pick the worst Jew that I can find. I'm going to bring them out and I'm going to say, it is in my power since it's your Passover to allow a prisoner to go free. Which one do you want me to go free? Pontius Pilate absolutely thought in his mind they would say, yeah, let Jesus go free. We don't want Barabbas running the streets. But look at what happened. 
And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will you then that I shall do unto him whom you call king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. Just like Adam and Eve choosing the wrong tree, here is Israel once again choosing the wrong tree. In the form of Barabbas. Turn to Romans 5 very quickly. Romans 5 verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For until the law sin was in the world but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So before God told Adam, you can't eat of this tree, if Adam had eaten it of that tree, he would have lived. It would have been fine. There was no law against it. But now he's given a law. You can't eat this tree. So verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, meaning Adam's eating the fruit, if through the offense of one, many be dead, which is us, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So, because Adam sinned, all of us are guilty. But because one man comes and he's righteous, if we accept him and believe him, then all of us are guiltless. Amen. Verse 17, for if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall run in, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. As it was one man who sinned in Eden, so it is by one man who dies at Calvary that all men can be saved. I like this. This makes me happy. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Now, we go from Adam where God gave him one commandment. One commandment, one sin. Then we get to Moses. Ten commandments. Ten sins. I mean, now it's a sin to just lust after something, not actually have it or want it or try to touch it or do anything with it. It's a sin to just lust after it. Try escaping that one. Tell me how good you are. So moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord amen I love this now I'm going to give you one more thing I'm going to let you go I call this babies in heaven as you know 
I have a granddaughter who was born and lived five weeks and she died. And then a couple of my daughters have had miscarriages. And I believe that they're in heaven. Mom, my mom is here, and back years ago, we used to have a daycare center here. We had a family that lived, they had a little farm out here on CC Highway, and they had two twin girls, five years old, Roman Catholic. And they had a 10-year-old ten, ten brother, But he was about 10. Okay. So anyway, Roman Catholic family. One of the girls and the boy was playing. Dad had some trees pushed over. Had cut the wood up for firewood and had those stump root wads laid over. The kids were playing there under one of them and one of them came back down on them and crushed both those kids, the five-year-old, the ten-year-old. Catholic priest comes over to console the family and says, and I may not get all this right, but the boy, well, he had had the rites of the Catholic Church done. But the girl had never been baptized as an infant. Therefore, she's burning in hell. Or purgatory. Makes me mad. Huh? They had to pay the Catholic Church to get her out of... That's a scam, I'm telling you. It's a racket. Now, let me show you what the Bible says about this. God knew that that tree, once, once he was eaten, would give Adam knowledge... Of the difference between good and evil. It would remove his innocency. So in Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said. Behold the man has become as one of us. To know good and evil. Now lest he put forth his hand. And take also the tree of life. And eat and live forever. But he knows good and evil. So God says. We've got to thrust him out. Of the garden of Eden. We have to put angels cherubs with flaming swords so they can never get to the tree of life again look in your bible deuteronomy 1 verse 39 because you remember the 12 spies come back from canaan land and they tell the brain they bring the evil report and they say we can't go to the promised land it's full of giants and those giants can pick up megalithic stones that weigh a thousand tons there's just no way in the world we can do this we're we're as tall as grasshoppers in their sight and i believe he's given a ratio i believe these guys were huge so god said fine for 40 days you guys are in there so for 40 years you guys are going to wander in the wilderness until each one of you dies so in deuteronomy 1 39 he says moreover Next dog I get, I'm going to name him Moreover. Moreover. Moreover, your little ones, which you said should be a prey in your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, 
They shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Notice the condition that God tells the children of Israel for those who can go into the promised land. I'm going to march you around for 40 years, and all of you who are above a certain age, you're going to die. But the children in your families, your little ones, who do not know the knowledge, do not have the knowledge of good and evil. I'm not going to punish them. I'm going to let them go in. Now that's one witness. And 2 Samuel 12, turn there. This is David and Bathsheba. Remember David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Tried to cover up the pregnancy by bringing in Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite said, as long as my men are out fighting, I'll not go in into my wife. So David said, put him out on the front line, make sure he gets killed. And that's what happened. David tried to cover up his own sins. The baby's born, but the baby's born sick. And while the baby is sick, David is sackcloth, ashes, fasting, praying, the whole thing. But then he hears word that the child died. When he heard that, he got up, cleaned himself up, shaved, took a bath, put on clean clothes, went and ate breakfast. And his servants came and said, David, what, what are you doing? Why are you doing this now? So in 2 Samuel 12, verse 22, and he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him. But he shall not return to me. It's your second witness. Now my theory is I believe babies, they're not saved. They're safe. And you might ask, well, how old then is it when they know the difference between right and wrong? And here's what I'll say to you. When Adam and Eve ate that fruit, what was the first thing that they figured out about themselves? They were naked. And they went and covered themselves up. And I think that at about the time that children, I mean, to have a one and a half, two year old toddler baby running around naked, the funniest, cutest thing in the world. Okay? And at some point, though, that child doesn't want to be naked in front of anybody anymore. Mom, shut the door, I'm getting dressed. I think it's that time they know the difference between good and evil. Okay? Just throw that in. That's an extra part of the sermon. You do not have to pay for that one. You don't owe me a dime for that one. That one's free. All right? So that's Genesis chapter 2. This is why, this is God bringing his commandments into the world and man failed. Man failed. Not yet, but he's going to. So next Sunday night, we'll talk about the joining together of Adam and Eve and how it's a picture of Christ in the church and so on. So let's stand to our feet. I appreciate you coming tonight.